going to talk about a specific subset which we normally handle uh, in CKD, that is cardiovascular disease. Although I am not a cardiologist, I am speaking this, this from a nephrologist point of view, like how we manage chronic kidney disease. I don't know whether all of you are aware, but the single leading cause of death in CKD patients is cardiovascular disease. This people will always say, you know, patients put on dialysis and they just die and they attribute everything to kidney disease and dialysis. But it is not so. Even in pre-dialysis chronic kidney disease, as well as in dialysis subgroup, it is only cardiovascular disease that is a giant killer apart from infection. Next slide. So both will contribute close to 50% of the entire deaths. So, so, the problem in, in handling CBD in CKE is delayed recognition. Still today, the recognition and treatment of CBD in CKE remains suboptimal. And it is generally underdiagnosed. You know, many, many times it remains underdiagnosed. This is because, this is because of exclusion from major major cardiovascular trials, you take for example any cardiovascular study which is taken as mortality as an outcome, including any weak intervention, including antiplatelets to PCI to coronary artery bypass surgery. Most of these studies exclude patients with CKD. That's the problem. There is that is why we don't have not much of level one evidence in managing patients with CBD and CKD. And there is, from practitioner's point of view, there is a therapeutic mechanism. Means many times people say the moment kidney is gone, everything is over. There is no point in looking for any other organ problem. That is the problem even among practitioners. Next slide. So this is the prevalence of CKD. You need to be aware. So if you look at population with CKD, uh, hemodialysis group, hemodialysis group, almost 42 percent of CAD. Left ventricular hypertrophy almost 75 percent, congestive heart failure 40 percent, almost like any other form of dialysis, like peritoneal dialysis also, almost equal. Even if you take pre-dialysis group, 25 to 50 percent, not much of data and other subgroup because people are scared to do angiograms in pre-dialysis CKD. So we don't have any precise estimate compared to the general population. In pre-transplant screening, many times we do angiography in patients on dialysis before transplant almost 15 percent have some kind of uh, CKD. So that's the problem of very high prevalence of CBD in CKD. Next slide. The problem is the moment you have a CBD in a patient in CKD, it acts as a double whammy. In the sense, neither of them gets diagnosed properly or treated properly. Many times we diagnose Empirically, CBD in presence of CKD because we won't be able to proceed with confirmatory tests like uh, angiography. Now, and even if you recognize the treatment outcome remains poor. So, there is increased mortality even if you treat an acute coronary syndrome in patient with CKD. Even if you recognize and treat, there is increased mortality. Same, even with the PCI, there is increased mortality when compared to a general population. And these group more likely to present with atypical symptoms most often. Next slide. About risk factors. So in generally, we all consider general risk factors in patients with CKD like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia as the traditional risk factors. But just these traditional risk factors alone cannot explain the high mortality or high prevalence of CKD in CBD. Even if you try to control diabetes, control hypertension and employ statics in widespread in CKD as well as in dialysis population, the results are not as good as you, as you see in general population. This actually made people to look after any other factor. Are they working specifically in this group? Identified certain specific urethra related factors. So, next slide. There are certain non-traditional risk factors that are normally is there in any CKD patient. These are specific for anemia, 
presence of mineral bond is in hyperparathyroidism, left ventricular hypertrophy, sleep apnea, homocyst anemia, malnutrition, inflammation syndrome, sympathetic hyperactivity, some mediators. So, so many factors which are not very common in general population are there in patients with CKD. Next slide. So, of this, the most important of uh, concern to a nephrologist is modifiable by whatever his intervention. One of the most important body favorite risk factor is mineral bone disease. So this is an, a chart to show the relative risk of mortality in patients with hyperphosphatemia. Phosphate is a vascular toxin, it promotes vascular calcification. So you take any, any end point of uh, cardiovascular acid, whether it be a CAD, a sudden cardiac death or a CVA, all are higher if you say hyperphosphatemia. Next slide. So, we all know there is some impaired abnormalities in phosphorus handling in CKD that results in hyperphosphatemia. There is another factor which is known as called fibroblast growth factor 23. There is in early CKD, there is increased FGF 23 that causes so many changes in the vasculature like vascular left ventricular hypertrophy, vascular calcification and atherosclerosis. Per se, hyperphosphatemia also increases FGF 23 and both these interplay result in accelerated CVD. Next slide. So if you look at the spectrum of cardiovascular disease in CKD, it can be a coronary artery disease or a cardiomyopathy, an arrhythmia, valvular heart disease, cerebrovascular disease as well as peripheral vascular disease. So you see all the spectrum in CVD in CKD. Next slide. So to <coughs> briefly discuss about individual entities, first is about coronary artery disease. CKD is considered coronary artery disease equivalent. But if you compare patients with this, only, C, only CVD with CVD with CKD, they have more calcifications, more medial thickness compared to more intimal thickness in regular CVDs, and very high rupture rate of your blocks, and more complicated blocks, and the area of the block as well as the cellular infiltrates remain the same. So the difference is more medial involvement, more calcification and very high rupture rate. Next slide. This is a comparison study to see the difference in the vasculature from early CKD to the late CKD. The more you see the whites is the calcification and the red part is the necrosis part. So as you move on from the stages B, C, D to E, you can see the calcification goes up as well as the necrosis goes up. So this is the problem which makes it more difficult to handle in CKD patients. Next slide. So the pathomechanism we need not go into detail but there are two different things that happens. One is calcification, the other one is inflammation. These two are the additional factors regarding this block formation in CKD. In this calcification part, hyperphosphatemia is the trigger which resulting in too many factors which are pro-calcifying factors like, like osteoprotagrin and core forming protein. What? So these are pro-calcification factors and there is some reduction in inhibitors of calcification that resulting in uh, vascular calcification. Next slide. And the second part is inflammation. The inflammation is due to activation of so many mediators like GnF-alpha, IL-1. This normally happens because of oxidative stress as well as AG accumulation of chronic kidney disease. So again, there is always a theory of uh, inflammatory theory of atherosclerosis. So if you look at CKD uh, and uh, CBD, these two processes contribute to the plaque formation. So how to evaluate a patient with CBD and CKD? All dialysis patients has to be screened for these presence of these specific risk factors including hyperphosphatemia, hyperparathyroidism, anemia, malnutrition, inflammation and so on. Patients who are listed for transplant should undergo annual screening. If somebody who has already underwent a revascularization procedure means a PTC or CAPG, they have to undergo the first screening at 3 years later than every year. In patients just on dialysis, they classified into high risk or a low risk category. In the high risk category, when there is an associated traditional risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, which is the rule in most patients, they have to be assessed annually. In the low risk category, once in every three years. Next slide. So how to diagnose uh, CAD with 
CKT. The problem is if you put uh, do an angiogram for patients pre-dialysis, it may push them towards dialysis. So generally, we prefer certain non-invasive tests. Unfortunately, there is no ideal non-invasive test. Depends on the availability, reliability, and reproducibility of individual tests. The institution chooses a non-invasive test. Next slide. So generally, the treadmill is the general non-invasive test which is preferred in general population. But here, there are a lot of problems with this. Our patients have very high prevalence of LDH. Many times they have poor exercise tolerance, they are anemic, malnourished, so they won't be able to run the treadmill. So many times it's resulting in uninterpretable findings. So in the sense, we don't do treadmill at all when you want to screen somebody of CAD with CKD. Next slide. So the preferred non-invasive tests are these two. Dopta means the psychography, echocardiography and myocardial perfusion skinjigraphy. So these two are the ideal non-invasive tests. Next slide. If you put these tests into uh, study to say which is the best test which can identify uh, non-invasively presence of uh, CBD, it is uh, Dopta means the psychocardiography. If you look at it, the probability identifies close to 91 to 98 percent. It is a decent, upper, decent false negative test. So if you look at this, this uh, the yellow one is the dopamine stress echocardiogram. So this is what we practice. Next slide. So in our day-to-day -day practice, what we normally do is any patient who is undergoing a pre-transplant evaluation or in presence of CAD signs and symptoms, if there is uh, so we we'll subject them to a non-invasive testing with dopamine stress echocardiography. If it is positive, better we move on to coronary angiography. If it is negative, again depends on your clinical judgment whether we need to go all the way to angio, risk them through dialysis. If it is, if the symptoms are not, also if there is an abnormality in the ECG, presence of diabetes and age more than 50 years, we will always subject them to non-invasive testing. And if it is so positive, we we'll move on to invasive testing. And Presence of traditional risk factors along with these risk factors will push them to straight away to an invasive test. Next slide. So during coronary angiogram, it is preferred to use an isovascular contrast agent. In CKD patients, hydration is not recommended, which is again may precipitate pulmonary edema. And uh, we always tell the cardiologist or tell them not to use radial arteries because that will be required for future fistulas, sometimes may later be rupture and pseudoaneurysm. And ask them to use, if at all, non-dominant arm, because non-dominant arm we want to preserve for future uh, AV fistulas. And many times we will have to plan a post-procedural dialysis, especially patients on dialysis, the moment you put a contrast in, they will end up in pulmonary edema, so we will have to dialyze them post-procedure. For treating them, anyway, the, we will start with management of risk factors, screening both we have seen, few points about Treating the modifiable risk factors like hyperphosphatidine. Next slide. So generally, phosphorus binders are used regularly in dialysis patients. This is because, despite adequate dialysis and despite dietary phosphorus restriction, hyperphosphatidine as a rule. If you look at in any dialysis unit, the prevalence in India is close to 60 to 70 percent hyperphosphatidine. So we use lot of uh, phosphorus binders to bring down the phosphorus to reduce the vascular risk. Generally. Aluminium hydroxide is the initially used binder which is no longer used because of aluminium toxicity. Calcium based binders are the widely used, calcium acetate and carbonate. And now newer non-calcium, non-aluminium phosphate binders have come like several and Next slide. So if you look at the advantages versus disadvantage of calcium versus non-calcium binders, non-calcium binders reduces the risk of coronary calcification because they reduce the calcium phosphorus product. So if you use in the long run, this is a study just compared several MR with calcium based binder. In coronary arteries as well as in IOTA, the calcification score is too less when compared to a calcium based binder. Next slide. And then to compare revascularization strategies in chronic kidney disease in patients with CVD, coronary artery bypass surgery, scores over percutaneous coronary intervention. Although the early phases, there is some, appears to be some better outcome with PCI after a, almost like six months, there is a definitive advantage of CAPG over PCI. Uh, the, the specific advantage of CAPG is it, it provides you a complete revascularization. 
when compared to a PCA where you do a targeted revascularization. That is the theory which has been promoted to say why there is a better outcome on C after CAPG than with PCA in CKD patients. Next slide. The second uh, part of CBD is cardiomyopathies. Prevalence is almost 75%. In generally, this is because of volume as well as pressure overload, because of volume expansion, anemia, and hypodynamic circulation by heavy fistula, and pressure overload due to valvular disease, which is very common in CKD patients as well as hypertension. Next slide. So, to identify cardiomyopathies, you have to routinely do an echo at induction of dialysis. Once the dry weight is achieved, this is what normally it is not done in most patients. So, you need to look at their dry weight. No point in doing an echo when they are fluid overloaded and say there is LV dysfunction. So, you have to achieve dry weight with an echo dialysis, then do an echo. Thereafter, every three years or when there is a change in clinical status, with anybody with ejection fraction of less than 40 percent, once dry weight is achieved, should be evaluated for. Uh, coronary artery disease and we need to aim dry weight in all patients no never allow them to have edema post dialysis that's the idea so that the burden on the heart is less and these people require an additional form of a therapy agents also next slide another cardiovascular disease we need to look at is arrhythmias because these are the common cause of sudden cardiac deaths in dialysis patients which is a common CVD accompanied almost like 40 percent of deaths in dialysis patients is instantaneous and they are the most common documented cause of death among the CVD also. So this can be due to so many factors like autonomic dysfunction, dyselectral edemia, associated CAD and cardiac muscle then intradialytic hypotension that is also very common. This is low with PD compared to and hemodialysis patients. And if you look at the arrhythmias, almost 40 percent is atrial arrhythmias and the atrial fibrillation is the commonest and this is the reason for sudden cardiac death as I mentioned. Next slide. So in all patients with CVD or CKD, we do a routine totally ADCG at the initiation of dialysis and there are antiarrhythmic drugs which needs to be avoided and there are some drugs which will really require dosage reduction. And in patients who develop recurrent uh, uh, arrhythmias, we may have to sometimes plant uh, uh, defibrillator also. So, in all our uh, dialysis units, we place defibrillators as well as new uh, PLS and ACLS training to all the health system. Next slide. About valve or heart disease, predominantly it affects aortic and mitral valve. Almost half of them have some form of valve or heart disease. It occurs a little early uh, in dialysis some population. Clinically significant stenosis is 10 to 15 percent. The general risk factors are the age of the patient, duration of dialysis, presence of, of hyperphosphatemia. If you look at the progression of valve heart disease, it is quite faster in patients with uh, CKD compared to a non-CKD population. Next slide. So again, anybody, everybody who started on dialysis should have valve heart disease screening and optimization of dry weight. And commonest to be what we see is aortic stenosis. So annual Doppler follow-up echo if there is an initial aortic stenosis. If there is not so, again once in three years. There are reports that they are using several number as a phosphorus binder reduces vascular ca valvular calcification also. Uh, when compared to the valves in uh, patients with an established valve of heart disease, both have a similar outcome, at least in CKD patients. Next slide. <coughs> because of the vascular calcification, many times repair is not considered, replacement is considered more. There is definitely more mortality when compared to the general population, but we don't have a huge number of data in uh, patients with CK. Next slide. About uh, cerebrovascular disease, again, uh, it is very common because of associated uh, traditional risk factors. And if you do a thoracic edema media thickness, that predicts the uh, future risk of uh, CBVD. Uh, but no screening in asymptomatic patients because even if you identify early disease, except risk factor identification and correction, we are not going to do much. The important thing is the risk of bleeding is quite high because of associated uremia. So, thrombolysis in acute CVA is not done in uh, CKD patients. And uh, especially with patients on, on dialysis, you need to monitor carefully the anti coagulation. Excellent. Uh, about peripheral vascular disease, all patients need to be screened and uh, imaging only in symptomatic uh, patients like who have active claudication pain. The important thing we need to understand is the angle brachial pressure index which we normally do for screening is not reliable in, in, uh, 
in kidney disease because of the arterial stiffness it has. So normally also they may have high annual brachial index. Sometimes they they have started proposing this tibial brachial index. Although we don't have a huge number of data to support it, it, it appears that it is not much affected. So it can be a, probably a marker to identify a peripheral vascular disease. Then again, outcomes like with coronary revascularization, peripheral revascularization outcome is also inferior. Excellent. So to control, CVD is the leading cause of death in CKD patients. And there are a lot of non-traditional risk factors apart from your traditional risk factors which play a role. Of among the non-traditional risk factors, hyperphosphatemia plays a very major role in onset of CBD in patients with CKD. And there is a definitive association between serum phosphorus and presence of vascular calcification as well as left ventricular enlargement as well as cardiovascular mortality. Next slide. Patients with more than 6.5 phosphorus should be uh, are at risk of higher death, so you should be carefully monitored with the help of adequate dialysis phosphorus binders, you need to bring down the serum phosphorus level. And among the phosphorus binders, non-calcium based binders are now slowly almost like replacing calcium binders because of their advantage in reducing calcium levels. And among the revascularization techniques, prefer always a bypass surgery compared to a PCI in patients with CK. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Any questions? Uh, <coughs> so, about uh, CKD with patients who are on dialysis. Potassium is a problem still, but in our dialysis, uh, dialysate potassium is only two. So, generally, hyperkalemia is one and well tolerated in CKD patients because of associated acidosis. You, they won't have very big manifestation unless the potassium is above 6. So our target in the any, pre -dial any dialysis patient is to keep the pre-dialysis potassium less than 6. Chair, chair.